Hello everyone, today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss a tale of two migrations, one into Eurasia and one out. So let's jump right in. <laughs> In the previous videos, we covered all members of the taxon Hominine, the African apes. Hominine is part of a larger taxonomic group known as Hominidae, better known as the Great Apes. Today, we meet our final extant Great Ape relatives, the orangutans, represented by three extant species, Pongo abelii, Pygmaeus, and Tepanuliensis, the last of which was identified in 2017. There was some indication of fairly recent speciation among orangutans 400,000 years ago, but more recent study has pushed that back to about 675,000 years, which is about the time the Neanderthals were originating. Orangutans are native to the rainforests of Indonesia and Malaysia, and all three species are critically endangered. Unlike the African great apes we've met in previous episodes, orangutans have reddish-brown hair and can get up to 1.37 meters, or 4 foot 6 inches tall, and weigh 75 kilograms or 165 pounds. Though they are primarily frugivorous, they also occasionally eat leaves, bark, honey and insect, and bird eggs. One additional characteristic of the African apes that we overlooked in the previous video is that gorillas, chimps, and humans share the tendency to live in relatively large social groups, often consisting of at least a few dozen related individuals. In contrast, orangutan behavior is markedly different as they are mostly solitary animals interacting with others most frequently during mating and child rearing. Orangutans spend almost all their time in trees and construct a variety of tools. The use of certain plants as medicine has also been observed in orangutans. On multiple occasions, researchers have witnessed orangutans chewing bits of the succulent Dracaena cantlii and rubbing the white soapy lather on their upper arms or upper legs for between 15 to 45 minutes. No part of the plant is ever swallowed. Interestingly, local tribes also use the cantlii for medicinal purposes, so perhaps orangutans learn this behavior from us. Monkey see, monkey do, quite literally. Among primates, chimps, bonobos, gorillas, a gibbon, and even lemurs have been observed using particular plants and or insects as medication. For example, the other great apes chew bitter plant pith or swallow certain leaves whole to control intestinal nematode and cestode infections. In the case of chimps, they swallow leaves of the bitter daisy relative Vernonia amygdalina to help with parasitic infections, and the local Tongli tribe uses the plant for the same purpose, recovering in about the same amount of time. The red-fronted lemur has been observed chewing and then rubbing millipede secretions on their fur, and some of these lemurs were observed to swallow the millipedes after prolonged chewing. This seems to control parasitic infections of oxyuridae nematodes. Moving away from mammals, birds like the common grackle and European starling perform a behavior called anting, where they rub chewed up ants on their skin, and even the honeybee Apis smellifera is known to choose flowers with higher antibiotic activities during microsporidian infections. Suffice it to say, humans are by no means the only animals to use medicine. Back to orangutans, our last common ancestor with them lived about 14 million years ago in the Miocene. We have a much better fossil record for their kin than we do for either gorillas or chimps. Though the exact state of orangutan and kin systematics is controversial, there are three generally accepted taxonomic tribes within the orangutan subfamily, Ponganae, Lufang Pithecini, Sivapithecini, and Pongini. Lufang Pithecini contains the single genus Lufang Pithecus, which has three species. Siva Pithecini contains four genera, Ancarapithecus, Sivapithecus, Gigantopithecus, and Indopithecus, with nine total species. Finally, Pongini, which contains two genera, the extinct genus Corapithecus, which in turn includes three species, and the extant genus Pongo, which includes two extinct species and the three remaining orangutan species. Lufang Pithecus lived from about 11 to 6.2 million years ago in southern China and is typically considered a primitive pongine, possessing heavy molars and large canines like Sivapithecus. 
In a 2021 study, the premolars of Lufangpithecus were assessed, and the researchers found that there were similarities between Lufangpithecus, extinct pongo, gorillas, and chimps. This makes sense, as Lufangpithecus is considered to be close to the split between these taxa. However, some researchers have argued that Lufangpithecus falls outside Pongine. As a 2019 paper argues, quote, In addition, the anatomical characters displayed by specimen MFTK176 indicate that Ancaropithecus corresponds to a more basal member of the Pongine clade than Corapithecus. The Lufangpithecus maxilla is very different from that of Corapithecus, and both taxa differ in many characters, including tooth morphology and clivus organization, but share no pongine synapomorphy. Lufangpithecus shares only one character with pongo, wrinkled enamel, which most likely represents a homoplasy. Therefore, our new data confirm previous conclusions that Lufangpithecus must be excluded from the pongines, close quote. Moving to Sivapithecini, Ancarapithecus is known from specimens dating to 9.8 to 9.6 million years ago from Turkey. There have also been debates around this taxon as to whether it is a stem pongine or a stem hominid. Very interestingly, a 2022 analysis pinned Ancarapithecus as a stem pongine, as well as Lufangpithecus lufangensis. However, this study could not find unequivocal support for Lufangpithecus hudianensis within Pongine. This study also found that Nicalopithecus, Oranopithecus, and Gracopithecus are more closely related to the African apes than to orangutans, and that the so-called dryopithecines are actually a paraphyletic assemblage of stem hominids and stem hominines. We'll circle back to them in a little bit. Sivapithecus, which lived from 12.5 to 8.5 million years ago in India, has had an interesting phylogenetic history. Its remains were first discovered in the late 1800s, and for a while, some researchers thought Sivapithecus was directly ancestral to humans. Other remains from the genus were later discovered and given names like Ramapithecus and Brahmapithecus, but as we've discussed before, the earliest name assigned to a specimen takes priority. With the discovery of more specimens, it became clear that Sivapithecus was much more closely related to orangutans than humans. Thus, it lost its spot as a direct human ancestor. Of course, as we discussed in Artie's tale, the African genus Australopithecus is directly ancestral to Homo. It's worth noting that Darwin hypothesized the direct ancestors of humans came from Africa, not Asia. Our next pongine is one pretty much everybody recognizes, Gigantopithecus, which lived from 2 million to 300,000 years ago in southern China. Its fame comes from, as the name suggests, its immense size. Gigantopithecus is estimated to have stood upwards of 2.7 meters, or 9 feet tall, and weighing over 272 kilograms, or 600 pounds. It was at least head and shoulders above any other known primates. Gigantopithecus overlapped in time with various Homo species, including the earliest members of our own species, and in the past, some researchers have proposed that Gigantopithecus was a hominin. Later skeletal analyses pinned Gigantopithecus as a pongine, and proteonomic analyses of its tooth enamel solidified this conclusion. With that in mind, what did this massive animal eat? Evidently, this giant ape was an herbivore, consuming C3 forest plants. A 2021 study found evidence of niche partitioning in Gigantopithecus. Researchers performed carbon and oxygen isotopic analyses of Gigantopithecus and the other megafauna in its environment, such as Cynomastodon, Stegodon, and the giant panda Aelurapoda, and found that they all clearly occupied different niches. It's also fun to note that some cryptozoology enthusiasts have suggested that Gigantopithecus actually survived to modern times and is the basis for the abominable snowman and Bigfoot legends. Though it is a very dramatic idea and would be an amazing discovery, there is currently no evidence in support of this hypothesis. The last member of Sivapithecini is Indopithecus. This pongine is represented by just a few cranial and dental fragments dated to 8.85 to 8.6 million years ago from northern India. It was originally assigned to Dryopithecus, but later analyses reassigned it to Gigantopithecus. However, it bears enough morphological differences from the latter to garner its own genus. Moving to Pongini, Corapithecus is dated to 12 to 6 million years ago from Thailand and Myanmar and appears to be the closest extinct relative of orangutans. Now, let's consider what all these Eurasian taxa imply for the evolution of hominidae. 
In science, one very important idea is called parsimony. Broadly, parsimony means that, all else being equal, the fewer unnecessary assumptions are needed to explain a phenomenon, the better that explanation is. Carl Sagan made popular the hypothetical of the invisible dragon in the garage, which is undetectable by all means. The most parsimonious conclusion is that there is no invisible, incorporeal, heatless, floating dragon, rather than he does exist, but is just undetectable. By the parsimony criterion, natural selection is one of the best theories in all of science. All an allele requires to spread through a population is that it be better at promoting survival and reproduction than competing alleles. From that simple principle alone, we get the whole array of types of camouflage, venoms and poison, horns and spikes, altruism, and all the other products of this process. As one fun example, a team of researchers determined whether separate or common ancestry for all primates was more parsimonious given all the available molecular, morphological, and biogeographic data, and they found that both species and family separate ancestry can be overwhelmingly rejected. Separate ancestry for primates is a ludicrously non-parsimonious belief. So how does parsimony apply here? The earliest ape relatives from the early Miocene lived in Africa, such as Morotopithecus, Proconsul, Akimbo, Nacholopithecus, and Equatorius. But later, many apes have a wide Eurasian distribution, such as the Dryopithecines, Gibbons, and Pongines. Then, gorillas, chimps, and humans have an African origin. The most parsimonious conclusion is that some early apes migrated out of Africa to Eurasia, diversified into Eurasian dryopithecines, gibbons, and pongines, and then the ancestor of African apes migrated back into Africa. The alternative conclusion is that over a dozen ape genera independently migrated out of Africa, with our ancestors staying in Africa all along. In other words, one hypothesis proposes just two migratory events, and the other proposes over a dozen. In the absence of substantial evidence to the contrary, the better hypothesis is the former. Interestingly, the flourishing of apes in Africa and Europe appears to relate to the favorable environmental conditions of that time. At the start of the Miocene Epoch, 23 million years ago, the global climate was considerably warmer and wetter, and it was actually getting progressively warmer, climaxing at the mid-Miocene climate optimum, which lasted from 17 to 15 million years ago. At the same time, continental movement led to the connection between the land masses of Africa, Arabia, and Eurasia. Coupled with a warm climate, this facilitated the spread of tropical and subtropical forests towards the very high latitudes across the Old World. Apes followed suit, spreading and diversifying across these newly connected continents. This was their heyday as the apes reached a level of diversity they never achieved before or since. For this reason, this time here has often been regarded as the golden age of apes, or the time when the earth was the planet of the apes. Unfortunately, all good things come to an end. From around 15 to 12 million years ago, global temperatures dropped significantly, causing the wave of extinctions known as the Middle Miocene Disruption, as was mentioned in the previous video. Even hereafter, the Earth continued to steadily become colder and drier. By the late Miocene, from 11.6 to 5.3 million years ago, ape diversity drastically declined, likely as the result of the changing climate. A 2015 study of pollen in a late Miocene site in China showed that Lufang Pithecus lived in a densely vegetated, moist forest paleo environment with long term lakes. However, immediately after Lufang Pithecus disappeared, the vegetation in the site changed dramatically. Herbaceous and aquatic taxa decreased, indicating that the climate was cooling. This appears to relate to the tectonic uplift of the Tibetan Plateau, which increased chemical weathering that draws CO2 out of the atmosphere. With less CO2 to trap heat, the planet steadily cooled, replacing tropical and subtropical forests with C4 grasslands. This meant that habitats favorable to the apes continued to disappear, driving many of them to extinction. This would have been more severe at higher latitudes, with the tropics becoming restricted to lower latitudes. The surviving ape species were forced to retreat to equatorial refugia, which could explain why the African apes migrated back to Africa, while orangutans and gibbons ended up in tropical Asia and Indonesia. In the previous video on the gorilla's tail, we mentioned a mutation in ADH4 that enabled African apes to metabolize ethanol more easily, which made fermenting fruit a more available food source. 
This would have been very important as fruit became more scarce during the cooling climate. There is another peculiar genetic mutation, one that is shared by all great apes, including orangutans. The protein uricase is an enzyme catalyzing the oxidation of uric acid. Uric acid is a metabolic breakdown product of purines, and uricase breaks it down further into a more soluble waste product. Uricase is ubiquitous among life, even found in bacteria. However, in a common ancestor of the great apes, a nonsense mutation inactivated the enzyme. Curiously, Gibbons also lost uricase activity, but independently due to a different mutation. Lacking the uricase activity means that uric acid is the final breakdown product that is excreted in urine. As a consequence, apes have much higher levels of uric acid in their blood compared to other mammals. Uric acid is not very soluble and has a tendency to crystallize at high levels, which is called hyperuricemia. When this happens, uric acid crystals may form into kidney stones or be deposited in joints, vessels, and skin tissues, a painful condition known as gout. A purine-rich diet with lots of meat and seafood also represent a risk factor. So why would such a mutation spread if it causes higher susceptibility to these conditions, not just once, but twice? It's unlikely due to chance. This suggests that there could have been an advantage to this trade-off. One hypothesis proposes that the loss of uricase activity enhances the conversion of fructose into fat. The first step of fructose metabolism consumes ATP, which leads to the depletion of phosphate and AMP to be broken down into uric acid. This ATP turnover, as well as high uric acid levels, stimulate the production of fat. Higher levels of uric acid, resulting from the inactivation of uricase, enhances this metabolic response to fructose consumption such that apes would rapidly build up as much fat as possible at times when fruit rich in fructose were abundant, allowing them to survive on the stored fat during times of scarcity. This would be consistent with the thrifty gene hypothesis originally proposed by James Neal in 1962. It says that we evolved the tendency to store fat in our bodies, which was important in the past in order to survive in times alternating between times of food abundance and scarcity. This would explain why we have such tendencies that appear today to be detrimental as it makes us more susceptible to obesity and diabetes. These detrimental effects only appear in modern societies where food is constantly available. So that's the orangutan's tale. Hominoids migrated out of Africa and into Eurasia, and then some hominids migrated back into Africa. Then, as we discussed in the Ergast tale, Homo erectus and a couple other Homo species migrated back out of Africa into Eurasia, and finally, our own species left Africa around 60,000 years ago. The study of where organisms live is known as biogeography, and it's one of the most important fields within evolutionary biology. It's a field we've already run into multiple times and will continue to run into in future episodes. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.